with this. I would like to welcome everyone to the first official webinar from Lifetime Theological Education here at Virginia Theological Seminary. This particular webinar is co-sponsored by our Office of Multicultural Ministries, and we are delighted to have that support. I'm Lisa Kimball. I am the Associate Dean of Lifelong Learning at Virginia Seminary, and I'm very privileged to be the host for today's conversation. The simple backstory of how this came to be is that as many of you who are listening are probably quite aware, um, there have been rising concerns about Islamophobia in this country. And we here at the seminary have been all too aware of the pain and the suffering that these are causing brothers and sisters who are our neighbors, both locally and globally. Conversation has been sort of bubbling around campus about how we might respond to that. And there have been a number of on-campus programs as well as conversations in courses but there had not yet been an engagement with some of our alumni and some of our leaders in the wider church. We thought the most quick and responsive way for us to begin to this structure a conversation that we hope will continue was to offer this webinar. And I am absolutely delighted by the panel of guests and people with significant experience that we will bring to you today. So I would like to introduce you briefly to um, Gay Ron, who is the Associate Rector of St. George's in Fredericksburg, Virginia and to Todd Green, Dr. Todd Green, who is the Associate Professor of Religion at Luther College in Decorah, but currently living much closer to us. Um, he's on sabbatical and spending his significant amount of time at the State Department. Um, he's an advisor to the State Department on Islamophobia, and he'll tell you more about his position there in just a few minutes. And then finally, I'd like to introduce you to my local colleague, Dr. Zainab Seligan. Um, Dr. Zainab is um, with us this year and next as a visiting assistant professor of Islamic theology and religious pluralism at Virginia Seminary. And it's actually to her credit that this conversation is really coming to be. She had met both Todd and Gay um, in her work in the wider community and said, these are two remarkable people. Well, how can VTS engage them in conversation? So here we are, we're engaged and we look forward to sharing this with you. I would like to begin um, opening us in prayer. Um, it is the place to begin in people of all religious traditions. So let us pray. Give life to me in your just way and raise your servant up today. Utter your word so I may hear. Pass over the reproach I fear. Behold, I long for what is good. I long to follow as I should. Revive my heart to set it right. Show me, O oh Lord, my soul's delight. I would like to invite our panelists to introduce themselves to you um, just in a brief sort of narrative form. How did they come to care so much about this subject? particularly in the context of interreligious dialogue. So Gay, if I would ask you to introduce yourself, that would be wonderful. Okay. Good afternoon to all of you. Um, I grew up in Savannah, Georgia, and that is a, a, a unique town, I believe, for crossing many borders, um, of interfaith borders and gender borders. And so part of that is just how I grew up and came to be. The day of September the 11th in 2001, my first response after hearing the news of the Twin Towers, I thought I've got to see if there's a Muslim community in the small town that I was living in, in Northwest Georgia, Dalton, Georgia. And so sure enough, I found a small community uh, with a small um, mosque and uh, reached out and invited them to come and pray. And that began then a, a long friendship um, with many meals and very slow uh, work. And then um, at other churches that I've been, I've, I've, I've reached out for the other. And now in Fredericksburg, I've, I have an, a wonderful way is that one Sunday morning, this young refugee mother came to us and said she was looking for the Anglican church. And through this young woman, 
we met um, many refugees and um, began friendships through our refugee work. And it um, really turned out through our tutoring and teaching sewing and involvement with the refugees that our parishioners found um, and made friends. So we've just continued the work. Um, that's and still today. So. Thank you, Gay. And now Dr. Zainab Seligan. I believe you're muted. Let me unmute you. Okay. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. You're, you're a uh, lovely talking head, but yeah. Okay. Hello to everyone. Thank you for tuning in. It's, um, I hope there will be an opportunity for me to meet you one day all in person, because as much as I value technology, I think it's great to actually meet face to face. Um, so I'm very grateful to Dr. Lisa Kimball and uh, to uh, Dr. Todd Green and my dear friend, Gay Ron. Um, for being here today with us. So I myself, ta-da, I'm a Muslim. Here we go. <laughs> Very visibly Muslim, uh, raised and, and, and born, uh, born and raised in Germany. So um, religious pluralism, dialogue, um, conversations about Islam, uh, Muslims, and uh, between Muslims and Christians was always, as far as I can remember, was always part of my life. Um, when I was growing up as a child and attending school in fifth grade already, I was introduced to a range of questions and uh, pretty quickly realized that there are a lot of misunderstandings and stereotypes about Muslims. Um, I mean, that was in the 80s. And then, of course, uh, after 9-11, uh, that just, you know, there were there were tons of things which were going on. And I quickly realized that um, yeah, that it was my call. Um, found myself uh, as an academic, but also someone who personally was very passionate about interfaith dialogue. And um, it was really a vocation that I realized, you know, that it's only through dialogue and relationships and uh, deep conversations that we. Uh, can dispel ignorance. Um, and, and that's not to say that there are not misunderstandings in the Muslim community, that there are a lot of stereotypes about the other in the Muslim community as well. So seeing myself as someone who um, was deeply rooted within the Muslim community, but also having friends in the larger secular, uh, also Christian community in Germany, I saw you know that, that there's a lot of need for um, you know, dialogue. And so I, I came to this, uh, I, I come to this from a very deep personal experience. And, um, and I'm faced with this every day, you know, people looking at me and, you know, having a range of assumptions or pre preconceived notions. Um, so that's where I'm at. And, and after realizing that I'm not just someone who wants to do it on a, you know, in a non-academic way. I found myself also in an academic pursuit of this. So that's how I ended up uh, coming to the U.S. as a student and wanted to learn more about Christian Muslim relations and, and where else to learn than in the U.S. because you have such a rich religious diversity in this country. So, um, and especially now in this tense climate of Islamophobia, uh, I think it's absolutely uh, more important to come together and and really talk about very important questions and we don't have the luxury anymore to to live in our bubbles so i hope that's that's sufficient so far <laughs> thank you so much among the many sort of the theme of the conversations we've had in preparing for today has all has always come down to relationships um and zainab is a sort of quintessential example of that for us. The idea that, that we are all learning always how to become ever more present to our neighbor, ever more present to the people um, whose stories and life experiences are different from our own. Mm -hmm. And so we, we echo um, together, all of us as a team, the, the invitation she cast, which is we hope to meet each of you in person if we haven't before. And again, if we have, 
um, and to continue these conversations in, in you know, face-to-face, -face, real time over a cup of tea. Um, there's something that you know, this can't replace any of that. And but we are but we're delighted that you're here with us in this this first tier of relationship building. So with that, um, I would like to move on to our third colleague, um, Dr. Todd Green. Well, thank you for the uh, introduction and thanks for inviting me to be a part of this uh, webinar. I think this may be my first webinar, so I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> <laughs> great, great. We're all, all there's room to learn. Dude. <laughs> we're all novices. Um, so, uh, you know, there, there's both, a, you know, I'm a religious historian by training, particularly European and U.S. religious history. And there's an academic route that sort of got me into the, some of this as well. But I, I think the more interesting route to talk about in this context would be the personal one. And there are sort of two sort of defining moments, I think, in my life that sort of, I think, put me on this trajectory to, you know, laying the foundation for having this interest that I do in the study of Islamophobia and also the sort of public, public scholarship on this topic and, and, and really trying to weigh in on public discourse, pushing back on anti-Muslim prejudice. But the first one would be when I graduated from college, um, well, my senior year of college, I met, met a young woman who I took an interest in and she happened to be Swedish. So when I uh, graduated from college, I moved to Sweden. I immigrated actually. And, uh, and I, when immigrating to Sweden, I got the equivalent of a green card and went through all the processes that a new immigrant goes through. Um, and it was an interesting period because this was a, a period in, in Sweden, like much of Europe, where there was a lot of other immigrants coming in as well, uh, majority of which were coming from Muslim majority regions. So most of my fellow immigrants weren't from the United States. They were from, you know, places like uh, Turkey or the former Yugoslavia, um, Iraq, Iran, and other places. So um, I, I learned to develop a very kind of special connection to people of an immigrant background in Europe, many of whom are Muslims. So that was a, a, a one sort of personal turning point. The other one was actually much earlier in my life. I grew up in Mobile, Alabama, um, in the deep south. And, uh, you know, the stereotype, and there's truth to it, is that a lot, there's a lot of evangelical Christians in the, um, in the deep south. And um, I knew at a pretty young age, I didn't quite fit into that crowd. And I couldn't articulate that for a long time. But I grew up and sort of matured as a teenager. Basically, in my heart, I was mostly an agnostic, I think. Um, I just didn't have the language for that. But um, being an agnostic in southern Alabama in the 1970s and 1980s was, uh, was something you, all, you pretty much kept yourself to yourself or you stayed in that closet, so to speak. And, um, and, and I remember just having a lot of anxiety growing up, trying to articulate what it is I believed or wasn't sure what I believed or what my identity was to the majority population of that region. Um, and, and it was always difficult for me and I, I really didn't come out of that closet and start to find my own spiritual path, so to speak, until I was an adult and, and had a little more confidence. But, but this experience of trying to explain yourself to the majority, uh, in a way that doesn't set them off, <laughs> to be quite honest, um, uh, that's a, a, an experience ingrained in me from a very young age growing up in Alabama. And, um, and as I became a religious historian, I've developed a particular interest as a scholar because of that personal experience with minority religious communities in Europe and the United States and trying to um, understand the challenges that they have faced historically and trying to fit in and trying to negotiate their identities with majority religious population in a way that doesn't, again, doesn't sort of set them off or doesn't, doesn't generate a backlash. And, and whether that's in U.S. history, Catholics, Mormons, Jews, Buddhists, Hindus, atheists, uh, and of course, Muslims. Uh, they've all had their own challenges in our, in our history. And so the, the way I teach, the way I write, the way I do scholarship is really with a, that radar to, turned on pretty high in terms of uh, minority religious communities. And that's a lot of what has driven my interest in Islamophobia and trying to use my scholarship and, and, and the background I have in, in this, as a historian to weigh in on a public discourse uh, at a time in our history, in a moment in our history, when you can pretty much say anything about Muslims and get away with it, uh, if not profit from it financially or politically. Uh, and I think there is a moral obligation that many of us have in the academic world and, and religious communities to start to push back on that more than maybe we have in the past decade or so. Thank you, Todd. You have to fill us in about this picture at the State Department, or, um, mm -hmm. or the, probably it looks maybe the White House, but yeah, tell us about the picture and 
<laughs> Where's Waldo? Where's Todd? There's yeah, this is uh, the one and only time I've been up in the diplomatic reception rooms of the State Department in Washington. Um, this was close to uh, after the time I started. I started last summer. And I'm about to finish up at the end of May. And uh, th these are other other people who have the same fellowship I have. It's called the Franklin Fellow, named after Ben. Um, and uh, th the idea here is to bring people from uh, the outside world into the State Department for a year to advise on an area of expertise that the State Department feels it needs. So the people in that picture, uh, aside from the obvious one probably most people recognize, um, have all sorts of different academic research backgrounds in the sciences and, and humanities. Um, and uh, in my case, I've been advising on Islamophobia uh, in Europe during my time there. But, um, but Secretary Kerry was uh, gracious enough to give us a, a quick photo op. That's as close as I'm ever going to get to him, I'm afraid. Uh, and uh, we'll see if Rex Tillerson gives us the same opportunity before I leave in a, in a month. <laughs> ever hopeful. Yes. <laughs> so thank you, Todd. Uh, so what we're going to do now is move into some foundational terminology and understanding. And so. Dr. Green is going to lead us through um, a conversation about, you know, what are the roots of Islamophobia? What, what is this thing we are talking about? Right. I mean, a common, I do a lot of public lectures and engagements on Islamophobia and a very common question for people who I think are sympathetic and want, want to be able to counter this is, you know, is this an old problem or is, it, is this post 9-11 that was Islamophobia born on September the 11th and, and, the, and the ashes of the World Trade Center and the Pentagon and, and uh, the short answer is no, Islamophobia actually has a much longer history, and a lot of that history goes back to the Middle Ages, some of it theological in terms of theological rivalries, uh, where you have Abrahamic siblings who, who, um, who can't quite agree on the, how, you t how you tell the right story about God and God's disclosure to humanity, and who is Jesus, and what is his significance, and, and that sort of thing. So those theological... Um, roots of Islamophobia go back to the Middle Ages, though, though that's not nearly as prominent today in the 21st century as it was in, in say, the, the 13th century, though it's still in the United States that there is a theological component to this. There's also a long-standing political rivalry between uh, is Islamic empires and European Christian kingdoms and empires, and this too goes back really to the earliest you know, uh, years of Islam's rise and its spread, um, and it very quickly came into tension into political conflict with European Christian kingdoms. So that political rivalry has shaped a lot of the perceptions that Western Christians and quote unquote Westerners, largely speaking, have had of Muslims and seen them as enemies as, and also as obstacles to their imperial ambitions. Um, so there, there's a, a heavy component of imperialism that starts in the Middle Ages, it's certainly there in the 19th and 20th century with, with British and French empires colonizing oh, the overwhelming majority of the Muslim majority world. Very few Muslim uh, countries uh, escaped European imperial rule in the 19th and early 20th century. Uh, and then when those empires did start to recede, the United States and the Soviet Union decided to have its own tug of war in the Cold War. But a lot of that war, the, uh, the ideological war was fought out in the Middle East. The Soviet Union and the United States still saw the Middle East and many Muslim majority countries as strategic in terms of trade and travel, but also in terms of, of energy resources. Uh, you can't be a superpower in the late 20th century without energy. And, uh, and so Muslims were still figuring into the, the, these imperial rivalries, even when the, the two big players on the stage were, were not necessarily the Muslim majority regions. Um, and that's all important because we've inherited those prejudices going back way back when theological and political and uh, in many ways, because of the war on terror and, uh, and, and our ongoing interest in the Middle East and other Muslim majority regions, uh, Western nations still have a lot of anxiety about Muslims and oftentimes see them as obstacles to uh, our own political ambitions. So that's a, those are some of the major roots, I would say, of Islamophobia. And encapsulated in all of that would be the, the ways that these political and theological rivalries generate other divides, for example, in relationships uh, that there just hasn't been very good relationships between Muslims and say European or Western Christians for much of history, mostly because either one or the other has been uh, in a context of political domination. You know, one's been dominated by the other, either Muslim minorities and European empires or the vice versa. And in a context of political domination, that doesn't lead to healthy relationships. Um, so that's one thing. And there's also just a large degree of ignorance that's been around for much of this history. Uh, and even when we get to the more into modern history where Westerners start to take more of an interest in Islam and studying it, 
many people in the West have not been able to, in many cases, to study Islam on its own terms. They have uh, oftentimes still engaged in caricatures and, and sort of portraying Islam, Islam in terms of stereotypes as a backwards, uncivilized, barbaric religion, all of which is connected to the political and the theological rivalries. But um, I would say that these continue to exist to this day. So that there, there are long-standing historical roots to this prejudice, many of which have morphed into something uh, as a little different in the 21st century, but that has a lot of echoes of, of age-old prejudices as well. Do you want to continue? Um, just what we thought would be helpful here is, is for Dr. Green to give us sort of a, an expansive view from his experience of the conditions in which we are living um, and, you know, what now is propagating this, these critical issues for us. And then we'll move closer to home through lived experience in a local congregation and the firsthand experience of a Muslim um, living in the United States, studying in the United States, raising a family in the United States and working in this interfaith, interreligious community. Sure, yeah, so the question of who's actively propagating it and how and why, you have a variety of actors, some of which are propagating it uh, unwittingly, uh, and in that case I would really refer to the mass media, um, a lot of television, news, print media, cable television, uh, internet news sources, uh, television and movies as well, uh, where you have many people behind the scenes who may not be consciously anti-Muslim or Islamophobic, but who nonetheless still have these very easy tropes to employ and frames in which to try to fit Islam and 1.6 billion people globally. And most of that involves terrorism. Most of the way, most of the Muslim characters you will find in a Hollywood movie are usually on screen because they are somehow there in relationship to the war on terror, the violent extremism or terrorism. Most of the news stories you encounter are in the context of violence. And we have lots of critical media studies that confirm over and over and over again that when the media wants to talk about Islam, it, it almost always does so in the national security context or in the context of terrorism. And mm -hmm. that's not just conservative media, it's across the board, it's CNN, it's the New York Times. Uh, a recent New York a study of the New York Times headlines found that Islam uh, it, it has a more negative impression in New York Times coverage than cancer and cocaine. You know, and that's just mind boggling, right? That mm -hmm. Islam can't even beat out cancer and cocaine in the New York Times in terms of positive coverage. So that's, that's a, a, a major source, and, and given the large widespread illiteracy about Islam and, and religion generally in the United States, uh, that, that's what's filling in part of that gap. The other uh, big source that's worth spending just a little bit of time on, and maybe more if we have questions about it, is what many of us would just call the Islamophobia industry, or I call the sometimes the professional Islamophobia network. And this is a cadre of uh, extremist bloggers, authors, some politicians, um, pundits, think tanks uh, that make a living and a career off of generating fear and manufacturing fear of Muslims in the United States. And, and um, they have become very powerful. I, if we were having this conversation, I don't know if there was a webinar 10 years ago, but if there were webinars 10 years ago and we we're having this conversation, all these figures would have been so fringe that very few significant politicians would have paid attention to them. And that includes throughout the Bush administration and going into the Obama administration. But around 2009, 2010, coinciding with uh, the President Obama's election and also coinciding with the controversy over the proposed Islamic Center in gra near Ground Zero in New York, you started to see these fringe figures get more of a platform in the media. Again, unwittingly, but uh, the media was an accomplice to this, but they started to weigh in more in the media and they started to shape uh, the narrative of Islam much more and public opinion has not necessarily been getting better uh, because of that, and uh, the antagonisms have gotten worse. And now you have this industry that um, has figures that have ties to people in the White House, um, which have been unfathomable a decade ago. Um, but Steve Bannon looks at people like Robert Spencer and Pamela Geller as the nation's premier experts on Islam. Um, and Geller and Spencer, by the way, are part of an organization that the Southern Poverty Law Center deemed as a hate group. But we have a hate group uh, that tries to shape the narrative on Islam that now uh, has the ear, at least indirectly, to the President of the United States. And, and that's what's uh, concerning. So these are the kinds of people actively propagating um, Islamophobia. Thank you. Is, are there any questions from our listeners at this point for, for clarification that you would like 
Dr. Green to address. As you might be typing, um, he's going to talk a little bit about who's really benefiting from this, um, because that's a pretty critical question. We've, we've got this sense that it's being propagated. Um, right. Where, you know, we, we're human beings, we're motivated by self-interest. Uh, we do good and we are rewarded. We do harm and there is a reward um, that sometimes cultivates a desire to do more harm. So tell us more about, about who's benefiting from this. Well, uh, to go back to those other two sort of spheres, those actors we talked about, in terms of the mass media, you know, when, you're, when your media outlets are owned by corporations that are driven by viewers and internet traffic and, and, and profits, uh, you benefit in that way if you, you, you keep this drama going about a clash of civilizations between Islam and the West and this constant threat of terrorism that you keep throwing out there over and over again, uh, you don't really uh, benefit in, in the mass media, unfortunately, under the current circumstances, by, by airing or pursuing a lot of nuanced stories about Muslims, either Muslims here in the United States or globally. Uh, nuance doesn't sell very well. Um, it doesn't go over very well even in, in Hollywood or on television. And, I, and, and I've seen some efforts in the past couple of years to try to push back on that in both of those realms. And even a little bit in the media, I think that the moral question is starting to rise about whether the media has been too much of an accomplice to this. And so I have seen some journalists even start to use the word Islamophobia. Five years ago, I couldn't have paid a journalist to use Islamophobia, uh, mm -hmm. the word. Um, it's just uh, completely not on their radar. I think with the past election cycle, we're starting to see some incremental changes, not fast enough in my opinion, but um, maybe some signs of hope. Uh, and, even, and some Hollywood movies maybe as well, but we've got a long way to go on that front. In terms of the Islamophobia industry, uh, these are figures that, uh, uh, people that benefit financially and politically. Um, according to uh, a report by the Center for American Progress in 2011, and it was repeated a few years later, it's called Fear Inc. You can find this on the web. Uh, according to Fear Inc., in the first decade after 9-11 or so, uh, they tracked 10 anti-Muslim organizations in the United States and, and in terms of their revenue and, and uh, found that they had about $56 million going through their coffers, right? This is not a small amount of money, right? And if you're in the church business, I imagine, you know, that this, is, this is a little different than the kind of money you, you might be used to seeing. Um, according to a more recent study by the Council on American Islamic Relations in conjunction with UC Berkeley and its Center for Race and Gender, uh, between 2008 and 2013, uh, they tracked 33 anti-Muslim groups. That that was really their sole focus, demonizing, dehumanizing Muslims. And we're talking about over $200 million going through the, the revenue, the coffers of these organizations in that time period. And any single organization can have anywhere from $1 million of an annual revenue to, I can think of the David Horowitz Center that has around 7 or $8 million annual uh, dollars in annual revenue. So we're talking about a quite a bit of money here. Um, I, I'm a small town Iowa college professor. I will never see that kind of money, <laughs> and, you know, uh, or, or the salaries that get paid for people like Spencer and Geller and, and Frank Gaffney, you know, uh, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars and more in some cases, just to wake up and blog about the, the dangers of Muslims, right? Uh, they, that's what they're making money off of. That's all that they do. And um, so, so those are, are the, the, the financial benefits, the political benefits we're only now seeing really pay off in the past uh, year or two, where uh, figures from the, the Professional Islamophobia Network, who again, were on the fringe uh, and largely ignored by mainstream politicians, conservative and liberal, uh, by 2014 and then into the 2015, 2016 election cycle, they were advising campaigns. Frank Gaffney, uh, part, part of a hate group, was a major advisor to Ted Cruz. He's now seems at the very least an informal advisor to uh, Professor Trump. You know, again, uh, Steve Bannon, who has strong ties to this network with Geller and Spencer, uh, Bridget Gabriel of Act for America, another hate group. Um, she had a meeting at the White House a couple weeks ago. She tweeted about it, bragging about this meeting at the White House. Uh, neither President Bush nor President Obama ever would have given these figures the time of day. So they benefit politically as well. And most of their political agenda is targeting Muslims. It's about national security. It's about a certain position on Israel as well, where there's not much of any negotiation with Palestinians. So the, that's the political payoff too. Thank you so much. There was a question um, for you. So Aaron asked, what are the names of the consultants to Steve Bannon? And with what organization are they affiliated? 
why is that organization actually considered a hate group? Okay, Steve Bannon. Well, he has a lot of consultants. The, 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 the couple that I was mentioning um, are, are more informal. Um, Robert Spencer and Pamela Geller are co-founders of an organization originally called Stop Islamization of America. It's now called the American Freedom Defense Initiative. Um, and um, he looks to them and has looked to them as the premier experts on Islam in the country. Uh, the narrative that they're putting out there is the narrative that uh, we need to be paying attention to politically. And people, he, he's, he's also in, connected to other people. There's, there's a lot of formal and informal connections here. Frank Gaffney uh, is another person I mentioned earlier who has generated the, the, this theory, theory of a, or this conspiracy theory of a civilizational jihad that, mm -hmm. that Muslims are sort of in here to sort of take over from within, you know, kind of like a Trojan horse and just, you know, one day we, we before we know it, we're, we're going to be run by Muslims. Um, and, um, and Bannon's been, had contact with these folks um, for years, um, uh, Bridget Gabrielle and others, and various political figures connected to the Trump administration have had more formal positions with uh, these organizations. The, the one that just comes to mind right now because I was hearing about him on the radio a while ago is Michael Flynn, who now is no longer with the Trump administration, but he was on the board for Act for America has spoken a number of times at their uh, at their meetings around the country. And Act for America is a hate group. It's a hate group as defined, at least by the Southern Poverty Law Center. And I know uh, those those questions can be contentious in terms of what makes a group a hate group or not. But if it makes it any better uh, uh, in terms of making that case, the American uh, the Anti Defamation League has also labeled Geller and Spencer and the American Freedom Defense Initiative as a, as a hate group as well. Uh, and, and the ADL is normally focused more, much more on anti-Semitism, but uh, they, they see no, no uh, uh, you know, wiggle room here when it comes to the kind of prejudice that these figures uh, promote, even in the name of defending Israel. Uh, the ADL wants to have no, none of it. That was really helpful. Thank you so much. Continue to offer questions. Oh, it looks like there may be one more here. Um, we are going to turn the corner um, from this sort of profoundly urgent awakening that we've just been offered to um, a local congregation, a congregation in Virginia that is um, particularly um, responsive to the, to the circumstances under which we are living. Before we go there, Nan Kennedy says, to the, probably to you also, Todd, how has your advising been affected since the State Department has been gutted? Is anyone seeking your advice in the State Department since the Trump administration began? Oh, you want me to do a tell-all in the State Department? Um, <laughs> well, uh, it, I, honestly, yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm, I have only been scheduled to be here a year, so I was scheduled to straddle two different administrations. I just didn't know what the second administration would be. And, um, and yeah, it has changed. It, it's not so much that people don't talk to me anymore. I'm, I'm, it's not like I'm shunned at the water cooler. <laughs> uh, a guy, right? We're not going to talk to him anymore because this is not our thing. Um, and at the top of the State Department, though, in terms of, of the agenda being set and the priorities from Secretary Tillerson and, of course, from the White House, uh, it probably won't surprise anyone on this webinar to hear that Islamophobia is not a priority. Um, it's not even in the ballpark. Um, so that said, though, it, foreign affairs and State Department is kind of a complicated place because there are programs that were underway prior to the Trump administration that, that still have to run their course. And there are ongoing relationships, right, that still must, uh, you know, be worked through. And so I have had opportunity, particularly with the current Assistant Secretary of State of the European Bureau, uh, to, to give some advice on how to address topics pertaining to anti-Muslim prejudice in Europe. And, and I've had a receptive audience in, in that regard. Um, so so there, at, at the micro level, and, and in terms of some individual outreaches to Europe, I, you know, I still feel that there's some work that can be done there. But yeah, this is not an easy place for me to be right now. I am very much looking forward to getting back into academia. I think I'm going to have much more of an impact back in, back in my professor job versus the State Department, where right now I, I do have limitations on what I can speak out against, at least in terms of formal policy, precisely because uh, uh, what I advise on is at odds uh, with the tenor of uh, the White House, at least right now, in terms of its perception of Muslims. That actually is a really healthy transition for us to yeah. move into Christian response, um, a place where we are mandated to respond. Um, the priority is not something that we can elect to ignore, 
Um, and I, the, the joy of this moment is that we're hearing from someone who is actively engaged in that holy work. So Gay, take it away. Oh, thank you very much. Well, as I said in my introduction, we began at St. George's with um, working with refugees from many different countries. But um, in looking back, I realized those who were Christian um, were very open about their faith and their belief. And those who were not Christian were very silent. And I wasn't astute enough to pick up on, on the, that happening in, in our midst. But even though through that, we um, continued to um, talk about the refugees and how we could help them. And um, then we began uh, some classes and offering some um, education on other faiths. And with that, we were able to um, invite a, a teacher from the University of Mary Washington to come and talk about, um, and, and it's interesting how we began. One of our first classes was to talk about the difference between um, uh, the Shiites and the, um, and how they, how they saw themselves differently and their different uh, religious groups or the tribes and, and everything. And then we eventually um, began talking about Islam completely and not about the different um, nationalities. And that took a lot of work to move from nationalities and history of the world to Islam and Muslims. Um, it's, uh, we had a, a terrific, um, horrible experience here in our area two years ago when a, our local mosque had a community meeting to talk about um, building on their land that they owned and building a, a larger mosque. And uh, there was a very um, small but very, very, frightening hate group that came and um, um, I took my granddaughter with me telling her that she's going to be able to see political discourse in action and instead we had to leave because I honestly was afraid that somebody would would be killed hmm. and it was at a, a small community center and with that um, that was really kind of a wake-up call for St. George's and that we needed to um, look at these questions um, in a deeper way. And we began, um, when a tragedy would happen, we would call our Muslim friends and our Jewish friends, and we would come together and pray. And uh, that, and then what we learned is that prayer was absolutely the right starting place but then the next step was we had to go downstairs into our um, church hall and we had to eat together and once we started eating together um, it changed our um, relationship we um, we then began uh, where we would have potlucks together and we would have it once at the Islamic Center and the next one at St. George's. And so that worked back and forth. But out of that, we also became more aware of people's fear. And the fear came from all, all different ways. One thing, um, I guess being in Virginia and being Episcopalian, um, we're very polite. And we try to be very nice. <laughs> and so how that translates in our parish is um, people sometimes just choose to stay away and not engage in this work. Um, and they have many different, many, many different reasons. And, and the important part for our work with that, I think, is to talk to individuals 
And um, will you say a little bit more about is why you can't join us at this potluck? Would you be willing to talk to me about that? And one parishioner, one time she said, well, you know, I was reading this wonderful mystery book on the beach this summer, and the mystery was about um, Muslims building bombs in their uh, prayer centers. And um, so I'm afraid to go out to the Islamic center. And she said, I know that the book is fiction. I know it's a beach read, and yet it has tapped into my fear. Um, the good news is that um, she accepted my invitation to ride together, and I promised her we would stay only five minutes if that's what she could do. And now she's become one of the strongest supporters of our group. Um, Yay. <laughs> I, another thing too is it, it takes some risk and the risk um, is different for all kinds of reasons. Again, one is that I may make a mistake. I may not know how to ask the right question or maybe I'm not dressed appropriately. Um, what if I bring the wrong food? Um, so some of those and, and, and the way we always try to counter those questions is just more education and education. And often when we get together for potluck, we'll say, all right, let's have a, um, an Anglican or an Episcopal 101 on what do you do at Episcopal covered dish suppers? And then we'll, what do you do at an Islamic covered dish supper? So another thing too is we'll offer, um, we give people names, this is so simple, but yet we need it. We give people name tags and according to their number on their name tag is the table that they will sit at. So we have to you know, be very um, purposeful in mixing up instead of sitting with the person you know. Mm. Um, so that it's just different things. And our children, the children have been magnificent because um, they, they don't have the fears um, that adults often have. And so we'll invite the children from the Islamic Center to come and be with our children or the teenagers to come together. It takes a lot of work, but um, it, the payoff is wonderful. So that's, that's an, another way that we try to combat Islamophobia. And, all, and, and I've, I'll ask people at St. George's, um, do you think we, um, is, a, is a Islamophobia a problem at St. George's? And, and people will quickly say, oh, no, 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 that's too strong a word. But in reality, it, it's, they are often very afraid. And it's the relationships and, and coming together that helps break that barrier down and uh, telling each other our stories. And, and the amazing thing always that oftentimes, I mean, it always happens. People will come away with, because we'll ask, what are your hopes and dreams? For your family or what are your hopes and dreams for this city and um, people will come away saying they have the same dreams and hopes that we have um, so that that's one of the the best things is storytelling and eating together can we, you can you say just a little about honeybee dem democracy <laughs> why, why it captured your imagination Okay, okay. We're, and just be aware that we're, we're right a little tight on time, so okay. I want to be sure okay. we... Yeah. Very fast. Um, I'm a beekeeper, and this is the most mm. wonderful book in the world. I, I th sometimes think all, all churches ought to study this book. Honeybees have, um, when they go to find a new place for their new hive, when they're going to swarm and leave the hive, they send out... Um, hunters for the right place and these bees come back to the hive and they do a particular dance telling about the virtues of the site that each bee has chosen mm -hmm. why we should move to that tree trunk 
versus that tree trunk. And all the bees dance and join the bee whose virtues they like and the attributes that they like. And um, they keep dancing and dancing until all the bees join one of the hunters and all agree that this is the place that they will move to. If they cannot agree, then the next day they send new hunters out and they come back and they start the dance again and they will not move until they have all joined one of the dances together. So it's just a wonderful um, wow. example of democracy <laughs> and how to work together. That sounds like an amazing weed. <laughs> the other thing, one last thing for me though, is I think to help our, each other understand that we are, we're all in this together. We really are. And it matters. And um, I think that's so important to, that we're all in it together. There's one slide maybe that talk, we, we had a um, rise up against hunger that event this past Saturday. And um, we actually, they, they always play great music at these events. It used to be called Stop Hunger Now. And um, this was our first time, Muslims and Christians, we were dancing together. Um, so it's, it's, it's taken a lot of work, but our, our defenses are coming down and our friendships are deepening. Thank you so much, Gay. And we have that final slide as our celebration slide at the end. So, ah, okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So, Zainab. Yes. Um, oh, I just, that was just such a beautiful way of <laughs> Gay hearing talk about the honeybees. It's just definitely have to read that book. It's very, sounds very inspiring. So Islamophobia, how do, how do Muslims experience Islamophobia? How do I as a Muslim experience Islamophobia? I have to say, like living in the United States for these past 11 years, living in the northern, first in Connecticut, New England for two years, and now here in uh, the northern Virginia region, I have to say that I never really experienced um, any any negative things so far. I mean, really, I'm, I'm happy to say that. But that's not to say that I don't hear from friends or in my own Muslim circle uh, about um, discrimination, stereotyping about Muslims. I mean, I'm very well aware, and I have to say, and um, Todd can speak more about that, that Muslims in Europe, I mean, and I was my own context of Germany, I definitely have experienced Islamophobia uh, in a very strong way. Um, just like, you know, remembering my time as a high school student when I started to apply for, um, you know, internships. And uh, on our German applications, when you apply for a job, you always have to put a picture of yourself on the application. So, one, of course, very visibly Muslim wearing a scarf um, was always very hard to convince people, even though I had very good grades and accomplished person, my German fluent, I'm like I'm a native speaker, um, as you can hear from my accent. <laughs> but it was very hard to get into the workforce um, simply because people had fear and also great reservations if not fear, but absolutely they felt that Muslims are just not, you know, fitting into the, you know, their understanding of what a company should look like and that, you know, so, and, and I had people, you know, supervisors, um, people who worked in companies telling me openly that my scarf and my being a Muslim is just simply, it's, it's an obstacle and that I don't uh, fit into um, their understanding and in fact it's very ironic but I had a friend telling me she was a very accomplished person she graduated in dentistry and was looking for a job as a dentist and she said that she went to a job interview and then that, that the you know dentist uh, said to her a woman actually that she cannot hire her because if she would hire her as a Muslim woman as a you know as a uh, dentist with a scarf that would just 
proof that she's supportive of Islam, which is an oppressive religion. So that's a dominant image. So ironically, you know, this this person thinks if she is if she is actually denying this Muslim woman uh, work, then she is actually doing something good. But if it's actually, you know, the irony is that you are actually the one who is oppressing that Muslim woman because she wants to be part of society and contributing to society uh, in. Uh, while being a Muslim, while, you know, expressing her faith, you know, wearing a religious uh, uh, piece of cloth. So this is something which is very, very, very strongly experienced by Muslims. They are at the forefront, uh, I think, of this phenomenon of Islamophobia, because the veil or the scarf is very much, you know, filled with with, with lots of symbolism, very negative uh, symbols. And as you've seen on the various slides, oftentimes when you look at the news cover, uh, the, the cover page of a news magazine, it's often the whale in black or a full face cover, you know, the, the face covered fully. So that, that really creates a sense of uh, fear. And, uh, you know, you see, I mean, so it's really, there's this idea, the veil is always the symbol of, secrecy and suspicion and you know uh, uh, violence and oppression and backwardness so that's really the dominant image and it's even if people don't admit it's such a such an established narrative that it's very hard for people not to impose it on you um on another uh, newsweek uh, cover page i think which i showed in class which i found very interesting i think a couple of years ago they um had this cover page which showed you know had this generic title muslim rage you know and then like this this one image of uh of you know two two muslim men or i don't know but so totally like <laughs> again instilling a sense of fear and an anxiety in people and a very general title that all muslims just act just very fanatical and are out of rage and are very uh, you know extreme and radical in their views and absolutely opposed to democratic ideas and values, which is simply not true. I mean, just looking at um, surveys and recent studies, the overwhelming majority of Muslims, uh, you know, 1.6 or 7 billion Muslims around the world, they are uh, very much in favor of democratic values, and they many of them live in the West. We have three to five million Muslims living in the U.S. Um, who actually very much identify being an American and uh, being a Muslim at the same time. So for them, it's not mutually exclusive. So again, Muslim women are at the forefront, um, you know, when they want to enter the workforce, um, trying, you know, being well-educated, uh, being Muslim, it's very hard because of this very strong fear uh, of Islam. At the same time, I think uh, on um, Todd's uh, book's cover page, you've seen um, an image um, which was actually, you know, the, the, like the, these right-wing parties uh, in Switzerland actually created the sense of fear of where Muslims are trying to build a mosque. And uh, you see the minarets as uh, weapons, black weapons. And then again, there's a full, uh, you know, covered woman in black. So we very much, again, the same repertoire is used, the same kind of image instilling fear. And instead of thinking that why do, why do Muslims actually want to build a mosque in a country? Because they feel at home. They love this country. They want to settle. They want to be part of the society. And building a mosque, building a, a, a place of, for religious worship is actually only a very positive uh, um, symbol of that they feel that they belong to this place, you know, and that they feel that they can worship and, and can live their faith. Um, so there is there's this, uh, sadly, this, this fear that, you know, oh, the, the mosques are built in the country and so Sharia is spread, you know, Islamic law will be 
lived and um, implemented in this country. And oftentimes in the whole Islamophobia discourse, you, you hear these terms always thrown around, jihad and sharia and, um, you know, uh, uh, hijab. So people don't even really know what they mean, but because they sound so alien and fearful, um, they just you know, again, buy into this whole notion and um, very much con basically confirm and peop what, what people think. So I think it's very hard uh, to break through that established narrative. Although we see, for example, that the overwhelming majority of Muslims have throughout history uh, lived, had amicable relationships, friendly relationships with non-Muslims. They tried to establish peace treaties they used the Quran, were inspired and informed by the Quran to work for social justice, to contribute to the common good. Um, so Islamophobia is very real. Uh, the fear of Islam, we just you know, saw from, from the recent um, you know, surveys, how many people are supporting this, the, you know, the ban, um, the so-called Muslim ban. <laughs> yeah. um, but the fear is real and because people are really... The, the idea of Muslims coming into the country from countries which have uh, some, you know, have uh, problems with uh, Islamic extremism uh, is very real. And so when people see you on the street, um, you know, all uh, what Todd said, you know, all these, these, these news from the, from the mass media are just coming in and you always hear the negative. So you really become the filter for the negative news and all what you can think of is the a negative idea about Islam. And you totally forget that the people around your neighbors, your Muslim neighbors are actually not like that. So I think, um, I mean, for many Muslims, I know Islamophobia is a very, very sad reality and they are deeply concerned about it. Um, Gay mentioned, you know, the building of mosque, or even we saw in the news the, you know, recent attacks, hate crimes have increased. Um, uh, mosques have been, uh, you know, um, in, in some ways were attacked or desecrated. So these things are happening and it's, it's, uh, it's saddening to see that the hate crimes have increased overall, not just against the Muslim community, but also um, anti-Semitism in general is on the rise. Zainab, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm painfully aware we've run out of time, which I think is an indicator that this conversation is urgent and it needs to happen and it needs to be much more expansive than one hour on a Thursday afternoon. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to just beg the, the mercy of our listeners um, and think that we should close this with some constructive, some opportunities for action that we want to offer people in their congregations, in their settings. And we were going to do that anyway, but I'm going to quickly read the three questions that have been posted that I think are quite helpful. Um, what I'm going to ask each of you to think is one, one way in which non-Muslim individuals can support Muslims and can work to counter Islamophobia where they are um, right now. And the three questions from someone are, what do fearful, what do fearful people in my parish, well-educated, middle-class white folk in the South, need to hear from me, their priest, to combat their fear that does something that does something that, that sometimes descends into phobia. I know that face-to-face -face meetings and relationship building are best, but we are a long way from at least an hour, the closest Muslims with whom we might share events. Mm -hmm. And then I might add, what books do I need to read, defend Islam, to defend Islam, and from well-meaning Christians who have been made suspicious by ignorance and the whipped up phobia that many of the last many years. Just to say to our listeners, um, I want to thank many people, and we don't have a long list of her time, but Anne Carolee, who is the coordinator for Lifetime Theological Education, is the brains behind this operation that helped us produce this webinar. And she has been co compiling a resource list from our speakers and maybe from some of the questions you're raising now um, that you will receive from us by email. So we'll be sure that that list comes with you, comes to you, as well as the video from this web webinar that you can share. Uh, so I'm grateful to each of you who's registered and participated and is listening in live. Uh, we're also really happy to um, continue to receive your questions here at the seminary and respond as faithfully and thoroughly as we can. So with that warning, um, good friends, one thing that people can do, gay. 
You're muted. I will unmute you. Mute. Okay. There you go. You're on. Okay. Um, I have learned that um, Muslims are so eager to come and engage in conversation with us and mm -hmm. will travel. Um, ask around and um, get help, get someone to help you find a person within an hour, even within two hours. Um, my experience is um, they will come and help begin a conversation. Thank you. Todd, what, was you, what would you recommend? Uh, in the short run, the best thing you can do is just to speak out and consistently, clearly, unequivocally. I think too many of us, whether it's been in academia or even in many Christian communities, we've been either silent or a bit muted on Islamophobia um, and have been struggling to find our voice and we can no longer afford to search for our voice. We need to start asserting it and inserting it into the public sphere and so that we start normalizing anti-Islamophobia just as Islamophobia has become more normalized. And in the long run, it is about relationships, relationships, relationships. Uh, everything we know about how you combat prejudice is building relationships. That's what moves the needle. Mm -hmm. And if you have to drive an hour, an hour and a half to take people to a masjid or a mosque and start to build relationships, then by God, do it. And it's just make that a priority in your budget and make that a priority in your, in your ministry. Uh, and it will yield dividends down the road. Thank you. Zainab. Yes, I can only echo that. I know it's hard sometimes if you uh, live uh, a little bit far away, but absolutely, even if it's just, you know, once in, once in a two months or once a month, you need to really meet the local people because face-to-face -face encounters, they, they're just having such a deep, real impact. Uh, studies show, I mean, Lisa in the beginning said a cup of tea. We wish we would have a cup of tea. But this is ha there was actually a project in Norway, I believe, in Scandinavia and some country. But they, they called this project just a cup of tea. Muslims started that because there was such a rise on Islamophobia or like prejudices against Muslims. And they invited their non-Muslim neighbors to have a cup of tea with them. And then after that, I think a, couple, a few months later, they, they looked at uh, the numbers and the prejudices significantly decreased and it really made all the difference. So really, I think we are relational beings. I mean, God created us in a relational way. We have a relation with him and he wants, he wants us to have a relation with our neighbor. That's a core teaching uh, in our faith traditions. And we really need to take that seriously. And it's not just a lip service. And, and also studies show that, you know, the more a parish, a mosque prioritizes interfaith uh, conversation, it flourishes. People actually learn more about their own faith because then they are forced to ask, Huh, what does my Christian faith actually say about this? What does Islam say about this? And that really le leads to deep learning. So absolutely, again, uh, prioritizing relations. And the second thing I would say, even if you're not um, having the opportunity to meet a Muslim, I mean, we have this wonderful blessing of technology. There are tons of webinars, uh, tons of educational resources out there. You can bring them into your church you know, even just watching what I do in my classes is watch YouTube uh, lectures by very important American Muslim leaders. Now you think, I don't know who these leaders are, influential people. Just reach out to major Islamic organizations like the Islamic Society of North America. Ask them what kind of resources they have. You know, just a click online. And so we have plenty of resources. And the third thing, last one is, I mean, in terms of education, teaching ourselves and really our communities critical media consumption. That really, I can't stress that enough, but as much as we really are concerned about food intake, we need to really uh, keep an eye on what we feed our soul and our minds because it really has such an impact on how we approach the other and how uh, preconceived notions uh, are formed. And, and really teach our congregations what it is, what does it mean to critically uh, approach media? How do we consume media? And uh, to be very important and how to uh, also see that there's a lack of ethical journalism and to have a nuanced view about people uh, to achieve that nuanced view. Yeah. Thank you.
such wisdom. Uh, I give thanks to God, who is indeed a God of abundant joy and relationship for each of our guests, our guest, guest speakers, and for each of you who's been listening in. Uh, we would like to continue this conversation, but more importantly, we are all praying that we will all respond in love to those neighbors um, with whom we share the planet, uh, women, men, children, um, Muslim, Christian, and people of all religious and no religious tradition. So we wish you well. We hope you'll join us again at our future webinars. We would welcome your feedback, and we genuinely want to continue this conversation. So there are resources available to you. They've been named. We will send you a resource list. Um, but we, more than anything else, want to be people in relationship conveying those resources. So be well, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.